And as an owner, like, man, like, if you want to grow your company, like, good Lord, have guys come in here, you know, that are spray techs and say they want to buy a house in a year and a half. And, you know, you, you're going to make that happen. Like, that guy's going to have to move up. You're going to have to make sure there's a place for him to move up. And the amount of growth that, like, you're going to have to do, like, to push your company hmm. to make some of these goals and dreams achievable, like, that's kind of what started driving us, I think. You know, mm. like it was like, yeah. we want this revenue, right? Or we want this margin or this metric or hit this. But it's like, no, no, like if this dude's going to buy a house, he's going to need to make this much money. And like, I'm not just going to give it to him. So we've got to grow this much and we've got to do it this mm. fast for like these guys' dreams to come true. And like that yeah. drives you, like that fires you up in the morning. So we have Brandon Lindsay from Fine Turf Lawn Care. Um, remind me, where are you guys based out of? Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte, North Carolina. That's right. Um, but Lindsay, did you grow up in in uh, North Carolina? Uh, or, I grew I know... up in Augusta, Georgia, actually. Okay. Which, given time of year, is it's about to be pretty popular down there in a couple weeks. Um, yeah. And then I moved to Charlotte about nine and a half years ago from Augusta. Okay. What what uh, prompted you to move? There's not much in Augusta. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, I worked for some lawn care companies here and, you know, different stuff. And I never, I never thought that I would make, you know, the money that I wanted to, you know, provide the lifestyle that I wanted working for other companies and it bothered me. So I started one and, you know, kind of had a goal to be able to pay our guys livable wages so that, you know, they don't feel the same way I did. And that was seven years ago today, actually. When I oh, congratulations. <laughs> that was when I quit my last job. Seven years ago today? Today. Wow. That's awesome. Congratulations. I don't know that I know the date of the last day I quit my <laughs> last job, but that's fantastic. Congratulations on that. Yeah, it's a huge win. So, Brandon, you went to, did you grow up in Florida? Yeah, I grew up in southwest Florida, about two hours south of Tampa. Okay. Um, basically lived there my whole life uh, until after college. Um, I moved to Vermont for a few years. That's when I just got started in the golf course industry. I um, just again, started as a weed eat, guy doing a weed eater. Um, moved back to Florida. I uh, kind of worked my way up in the golf course industry as assistant superintendent. Um, went back to school for like uh, online classes at Penn State for turf grass. Um, loved the career, loved the job, but I didn't love 60 to 80 hours a week, no weekends, low pay. And so, um, I basically decided with my wife that at that time, girlfriend, that I wanted to start a business and we moved to Charlotte for that reason. Did the 60 to 80 hours a week ever go away? When I was working at the courses up North, it did in the winter time. We just cutting down trees and stuff. That was 40 hours a week. But in Florida, not really. I'd say they you know, you're, uh, heavy plays in the winter and then called snowbirds and then summertime's renovation mm -hmm. so it just didn't ever went away yeah that's awesome uh what town in southwest florida did you grow up in uh, i'm from cape coral cape coral fort myers area also about 45 minutes north of naples yeah gotcha we're actually going to be headed uh headed down to fort myers that that area here in a couple of weeks we have a franchise uh franchisee in in that area gale and uh we're I haven't explained this to you guys yet, and I don't want to get too into the weeds, but we're on a tour right now visiting all of our franchise locations uh, throughout 2024 and 2025, uh, but we're hosting events and, and uh, trying to raise awareness of the pet waste removal industry through some more guerrilla marketing initiatives, some campaigns. Um, and so anyways, like I was saying earlier, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be, we're, we're going to be in Charlotte in like, that's true. Month and a half, two months yeah, was, actually. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, about, late yeah, late May. We need to we need to set yeah. something up. That's exactly yes. what we're on the tour to do. Is when we're in these areas, we're we're meeting the people that we we're creating relationships with, and we're we're mm -hmm. host, helping our franchisees, serving our franchisees, and like Ben said, bringing awareness uh, really to, to to the pet waste industry, but also our 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 brands, uh, our our brands, but. Like Ben said, not to get too far into the weeds on that. That that could that. Could, one that of our could. goals is like trying to create networking and you know meet new other business owners. So 
We're yeah. always open to whether it's you guys or maybe your franchisees that want to come in and talk to us and form a partnership, networking, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we're we're about to sign a franchisee right there in Charlotte. He's an existing franchisee, uh, lives here in Dallas, but he owns Phoenix and Las Vegas. But he's uh, him and his partner are about to buy Charlotte and Raleigh Scoop Soldiers. Uh, so we've got our corporate operations there right now, but he's about to buy those, uh, buy those clients, and then he'll be a franchisee. Okay. Yeah. So, Sorry about that. I got distracted for a second. Like Ben said, this is pretty free form. So, uh, but but my daughter was try- telling me that she just lost her one of her teeth. So she was oh, excited wow. about that. <laughs> was she asking for money? She wasn't. That'll be the night. That's awesome. But the pet waste business excites me a little bit because we actually own another business as well. It's called True Mosquito, where we do mosquito spraying. So it's a simple business yeah. model where it's yeah. one service. Mm-hmm. We have, we're opening up our second and third branches this year. Um, so that that whole model, that one service, seeing how complicated lawn care can be, is pretty appealing. So simple. So you're so this is the mos- a mosquito service you uh, you started at a separate brand. Yeah. Yeah. We used to do it under the umbrella of Fine Turf. And then we have two other mm-hmm. partners who also own lawn care companies that was doing mosquito under their, you know, lawn care company. We basically split that off and started our own separate company for just that one service. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Right. Can you say the name again? It's True Mosquito. True Mosquito. Okay. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, when, did, when did that happen? That was last year. We started, yeah. We started Charlotte last year. And we're doing Augusta and Roanoke. Virginia this year. Okay. Okay. So that's great. That's How awesome. many clients do you guys have? I'm like 250, 300 in Charlotte and about the same in Roanoke. That's and great. Augusta's just starting. So how'd y'all pick those markets? Like what may had you choose those markets? Is it because of what your network and what and, and who you know in those areas? Exactly. Yeah. Our other partners from the other locker company, they have a branch in Charlotte and Roanoke. So they were rolling okay. their customers over. Mm-hmm. And okay. obviously, though, the infrastructure and the shop there and everything, it's a lot easier to kind Simple of get off the start. ground. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Y'all have got uh, y'all have got definitely more more mosquito than we've got. We don't. Mm-hmm. We've been doing mosquito five seven years at Chorby, and I don't think we've broken two hundred. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a small it's a piece of our pest control department. Mm-hmm. And it's just a small piece of that department. It's a cool biz- It's a really good business, and like you say, it's a really simple business. That's what's the the, the simple services are. <laughs> they're the things that yeah. it, I haven't figured out how to make money on the, the things that are not simple services yet. <laughs> Going to, but not yet. Yeah. So seven years at, at Fine Turf. So d- how did you guys meet? That's what I want to know. So we started separate companies. So he started Fine Turf like pretty much about seven years ago. Yep. And then I started a separate company and he was doing some mowing and chemical and hated mowing. And I was doing a lot of mowing and landscaping. And didn't know anything about chemicals and like I was out like backpacking yards like trying to kill it. I didn't know what I was doing and uh, one day I just got real frustrated it was like I hardly had any chemical applications so I was like I commented in a Facebook group I said does anyone want to like do all of our chemical applications and maybe just give us some mowing or something mm-hmm. and so he that- commented and then we ended up meeting for breakfast like that Saturday and found out that, I mean, we lived like a mile and a half away and serviced the same areas. So then for what, I guess like the next four years, yeah, we referred work back and forth like crazy. Mm-hmm. Like I would send him chemical, he would send me mowing and landscaping. And, and like, I mean, our trucks were like, we were passing each other almost every day working. <laughs> um, and then I had a partner at the time, um, and we kind of wanted to go in different directions with, like, growth. And so um, we ended that partnership, and then me and Brandon merged at that point. So That's really cool. So um, I can totally relate. My business partner, I, I was just mowing yards at the company, or my company at the time, which is today Chorby, uh, Emerald Lawn and Landscaping. And I was just mowing. I, I didn't. I didn't want to get the licenses and all of the, the, all that goes into to being a proper turf applicator. Uh, but my business, but, but at the time I had hired a friend and he was helping me grow. And he was like, EJ, you've got, I was subbing out all this FERT. I had 200 clients that I was subbing out. And he was like, you've got to bring this in house. You got to bring this in house. 
And so I said, look, you, you go get licensed and we will partner in a business in a new business, in a FERP business. And we'll have a separate FERP business from the mowing business. And we did that for about a year before we became partners in what is today Chorby. Uh, but it was all it was all around FERT and converting from mowing and getting into FERT and expanding into that. So that's awesome. Yeah. But we're still partners today. You don't hear that too often. No. <laughs> you guys seem to have a pretty good relationship. Y'all been y'all been together how long now? A couple of years? A couple of years yeah. together, yeah. 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 How, how's it been? How's the how, how? Give us some advice. Give us your insights on on uh, the dynamics of a partnership. I think that um, so like a partnership that's formed originally is probably easier at first, right? But like merging companies, like when you already have staff mm. and you already have systems and different CRMs, and everything is completely different. Like. It is hard. It is hard to do. But there's an adjustment period there, and there's just, it's hard. I don't mean, it's really, really difficult. And we were also kind of right at, both of us right at that million, you know, kind of right around that million dollar mark where, like, we're kind of starting to realize that, like, you need some systems and, like, you know, office staff and, like, you have to start working on your personal leadership. You're kind of at that point combining together. And I mean, it, and growth exactly, and your right. growth, right? I mean, it can be an absolute just like dumpster fire if you let it. Yeah. The first six months were definitely rough. You know, we both had to essentially, you know, merge businesses, but then, you know, cut out clients that maybe didn't fit our new model, mm -hmm. um, reorganize things, you know, took a little bit of hit on probably what the revenue could have been just to, try to define like what our ideal client is. Let's go mm -hmm. after just this. Um, so that first six months, six, eight months was probably a little difficult, but it's, uh, if it's getting better and better, I think the, I think the hardest part going forward would just be like, you know, we merged, we have completely different skill sets, right? He's really good at sales and I'm more good at good operations, which works very well. But as we scale and grow, where do our new identities fit in that model? Because I mean, three or four years from now, he's not going to be selling. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to deal with operations as much. So how do we both continue to like move up that ladder as a partnership? Um, yeah, that's the will probably be the three to five year challenge. You're thinking correctly that it does it does evolve and change at least in my experience. You know what my business partner and I did, uh, and how we split and did and operated five five years ago and ten years ago is very different than today. So you're you're right. It 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 ebb and flows. It evolves. And there's seasons for different uh, seasons of your business and seasons of your partnership that are going to are going to change. Mm -hmm. So when did you guys find the Simple Growth Mastermind group? Was that January of what? So it's 24 now, it'll be January of 23. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we were at Mike Andy's conference and he was speaking. Okay. Summit over in Washington, mm -hmm. and we saw Dan speaking, and we just both went up to him and started talking to him. And that's how we heard about it. Yeah, so we found out civil growth through Dan Rouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. And Dan was at a Mike Andy's Landscape conference. Summit. Yeah. Landscape Summit that. conference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How'd you find the Landscape Summit conference? Uh, <laughs> you logged into YouTube and owned a landscape company in the last three years. You probably know about it. <laughs> yeah, that's probably fair. Yeah, he's all over the internet. I mean, he was probably one of the first guys I followed. Him and, like, Jonathan Toshnik with, like, you know, Million Dollar yeah. Long Hair. Those are probably the two guys when I first started out that I really paid attention to. So, you know, find that, so find that landscape summit just it's everywhere on ads. You guys use Service Autopilot? What do you use? We use Real Green. Okay, yeah. You know, which is geared towards mostly fertilization week drill yep. companies, which is obviously what I was before. It's a little different, a little difficult with landscaping and mowing. Um, it, it is. I've heard really good things about it for the fur industry specifically, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've never heard it. I've never heard good things about it necessarily for mowing and all of the additional things that go with lawn and landscapes. It's not terrible for mowing. It's not great. It's definitely not terrible. There's worse ones. It's, right. It's decent for mowing. I think it's unfair to say it's horrible for landscape because it's not even built for it. It's not meant for it. You know, you're, right. it's just, it's like trying to use a Phillips head screw to screw in a flathead. Just right. Work. On landscaping, are you guys are you guys big in landscaping? Is it is it one of your preferred services or is uh, it more of an ancillary service? We do as little as possible. 
So like the the issue is like, you know, everything we do is reoccurring, which was nice. Like, you know, when I came in, like that FERT model is so reoccurring that mm -hmm. from that point we kind of took the things that weren't and made them reoccurring. So like you know, even like our pruning, like we will not right. do a one time pruning. We sell you a pruning, we're gonna do it three times a year, every year, forever until you tell us to stop. Right. It's a subscription type model. Yeah, yeah, if we do your mulch this year, we're coming back next year to do it next year unless you tell us not to. Mm -hmm. So, but the issue arises is like the pruning cycle and a flower cycle, and then you have like this month and a half gap of you really don't have any enhancement work. So, out of that need is when we do landscaping, just to kind of. Okay, so you back. schedule it all up to the the off season. Yeah, in between enhancement cycles that are reoccurring. So that's perfect. That's, that's where you can also make it. You, you get the right quality clients in that because you get the clients that, that are going to be flexible. If, they, if, they're, if they're right, I would think so because you're able to schedule. If you're able to schedule them just during that off cycle, I imagine they're pretty flexible. And those are usually your preferred clients. Yeah, yeah and that's our, like for the residential mowing. Like we're, you know, we're scaling for very fast, but like residential mowing, it's a very specific client. You got to live in a very specific area, very specific type of net worth. Like they want all the services that we offer. We don't do mobile and goes per cut. It's a monthly yeah. fee every single month. We handle everything roughly. Um, and those are the clients that have better landscaping jobs. So it's better to fill the gaps with those types of jobs. Right. Right. The downside is our mowing grows like, I mean, painfully slow, right? It's almost one of those things of like, yeah, you know, we're just trying to grow like a crew a year or a truck a year. You're, that's your mowing, you say, but your fur grows faster. Fast. Yeah. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. With mow, but like with mowing, like we won't mow your yard unless we're doing, you know, weed control for our program, bunch of sods. Okay. Program aeration and seeding, like we won't just mow. So, and we we keep it in such a tight, tight area so that it can be profitable. That it's just. There's not a huge market really right. for it because we have such a small area and then, you know, we're so picky with it. So it just, but with fur, we grow extremely fast. So the goal mm -hmm. with mowing is just to add one crew per year, really. Right. So That's like, awesome. In the spring, uh, it's just a race to capacity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Tell me about Fine Turf, uh, the name, your brand. Was this something that you guys rebranded to and became? Uh, is it was it one of y'all's brands prior? Yeah, it, was, it was what I started with originally. Okay. And I think the word fine turf would, it came from the golf course industry. Is that any like shorter cut grass, whether it's a fairway or a tee box or green, you always refer to it as like fine turf. Yeah, I, um, that's kind of where it came from. I actually I, I really like the name and was thinking in those some ter same terms. Like that's that's a that's a really clever name. I'm surprised yeah. if you just started in the last few years, I'm surprised it wasn't taken. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the domain name fine turf was for like a sod farm or something, I think. So that's how we fine turf lawn care. But yeah, I was surprised as yeah. well. Have you been able to buy that domain yet? Not yet. No. <laughs> I would love to. So I hate telling people our email, fine turf lawn care. It'd be a lot easier if it was just fine turf. Fine turf. Yeah. Love that. So um, you guys fan, uh, found Dan Ralphs uh, through the Landscape Summit, and um, you guys joined in January of 23. I, I know from spending a little bit of time uh, with Simple Growth that a lot of uh, their focus is about understanding your mission, vision, values, and getting in alignment within your org chart. Like, how, What kind of impact did that have for you guys in January? Not much? Or did you guys already have that kind of figured out prior to joining? That was about the most perfect timing, given okay. like going through the merger, you know? Like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, what are our mission and values? And, you know, one of the weird things that has happened in the last year and a half is like, you know, me and Brandon will think about things very differently. And, but we almost always get to the same conclusion and want the same thing without even talking to each other. So it's been cool to see how, like, we want the same things for the company and our people and ourselves, but getting it all on paper and, you know, getting everybody in line and getting, you know, a leadership team that's focused and wants the same things and working together. Like, 
I mean, that's just it was so crucial at that time for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we weren't we weren't didn't have any of that before. I mean, we got it now. We have banners in our shop. We have stuff on the walls. You know, we try to hire and fire by that. And you know, one of the few things I've said recently, I think if you have your systems and processes in place and you have your core values. Most questions that are asked on a day-to-day basis, if you revert back to either of those, you almost get your answer, right? Well, how should I do mm-hmm. this? If it's not in the yep. system process and you look at your core values, the answer is usually pretty easy. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a really that's interesting well perspective. I like that a lot. Um, well so would you mind sharing what is what is the mission of Fine Turf Lawn Care? Our mission right now, it's a three-year mission, is to be you know the best, most well-known residential lawn care company in South Charlotte. By the end of 2020, with a revenue goal of 7.2 million out of 20 percent. So, what is the strategy behind being the most well known in your area? So, I mean, it's right now the strategy is you know, massive growth in fur because it's you know the simplest for us to scale, and we need a lot of trucks and a lot of yard signs out, and a lot of people wearing fine turf uniforms be a household name in a large market Mm -hmm. Um, and that's like the easiest and quickest to grow but I I think outside of that you know being the most well known also like you have to have a good reputation yeah and how do you want to be viewed in the market yourself right so like you can get a ton of work really quick through marketing and you can buy a bunch of trucks and put a bunch of signs up but how you're viewed um, doing it at that pace is hard right Mm. and so that's what you know, we spent a lot of time really in the last 12 months kind of working on is, you know, like it's a little things to me, like our guys were wearing T-shirts and now every employee wears a collared shirt. We have a uniform service to where our guys are in clean pants. You know, we started a thing where we cook out every Thursday for all the guys because we want them to feel appreciated. And, you know, if guys are taken care of, then, you know, customers – Mm-hmm. You know, our customers are going to like our guys. Our trucks are clean. It's, you know, it's all those things that you talk about and you want to do and you do when you're at a million and a million and a half and two million. It's like it's getting it gets a lot harder to do it as you grow, because for me, I get so focused on, you know, we need to have new for customers this month. And like, that's what we're going to do. You know, and Brandon gets so focused on. You know, if we hit this margin, we can spend more on marketing, you know. So it's like, how do you keep up that, like, who's getting food for Thursday? And Mm -hmm. are these trucks clean? And, you know, this guy's got some stuff going on at home. Is he okay? Like, maybe we should talk to him next week. And, you know, that's where it gets hard. And and I think that's where we've focused a lot recently. Yeah. Like I said, the bigger you are, the harder it gets. You got to, I mean, the sooner you start, the easier it is. You know, we even tried to do some, you know, more neighborhood events, you know, put a tent up and not as much for like getting customers, but just people seeing our name out there and putting a face to the brand. Um, You know, just trying to, again, networking with other business owners and, you know, getting more reviews and not just reviews of five stars, but like actually trying to engage with our customers and like, why are we, you know, why do they think we're good? Just trying to Mm -hmm. get that, keep that quality up there as we grow. I know that sometimes those two things don't always align, but that's kind of what our goal is. One thing I see here from y'all is that y'all are very focused on your brand and and that's, that's very wise Mm -hmm. to be very focused. I actually think that that's something that we have waited too long and that's something we're, we're focused on now. I can very much so mirror a lot of what you're saying. Uh, on on the focus and building the brand. You mentioned putting up a tent, not necessarily expecting to get XYZ clients out of it, but just get the brand out there. And I think we've been a little bit slow to action in that mindset. We've always still chased the client, you know, and every dollar has gone to chasing the client rather than focusing some dollars and maybe in some cases more dollars to just getting the brand out there. And, and getting that, and, and that matters a lot. And, and I, don't, I don't know exactly all the different social media y'all listen to, but some of the stuff I listen to, you think of Gary V. He's he's constantly talking about brand and the value of brand in the in, in the future, even more so than today. Like you said, never never better time to start than now. Mm-hmm. It's hard to do it though. It is. It's really so hard to do it. On like, if I spend this in marketing, I get this, and then it's no doubt. Like, more, more, I mean, more, more. No doubt. 
it, it, it's a totally different game. A billboard is, it, I mean, it's the most classic thing in the world, but at the same time, how do you track that? Yeah. It's not like a door hanger or Google, Google ads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially as we get more into systems and processes, you know, you have KPIs and scoreboards. It's like, how do you judge that? If guys are measured on yeah. the scoreboard, but we're trying to brand, like, where does that come into play? You just, exactly. You know, it's not, not to mention, uh, Lindsay, you keep saying it's hard. I would say it's expensive. In some ways, it's easy for it to be. It's expensive. That's the hard part is how expensive it is. <laughs> but I know what you mean also on the hard part. Uh, you were talking earlier on the, the leadership side. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes. In fact, on one of my very first iterations of, of my, my website, my Pet Waste Millionaire website, uh, was a John Maxwell quote, uh, everything rises and falls on leadership. And that's where you get exponential challenges. And if you don't build the foundation of a leadership team, it all falls on, on the two of you. And then, and then the two of you can't focus on anything else. So building out that leadership team, as y'all were talking about a minute ago, I know I'm going back a few minutes, but uh, building out that leadership team is, is, is extremely hard. It's probably the hardest thing, but it's also the, the thing that pays off the most in my in my opinion, up to this point in my past experience. I think we've been super blessed with that portion of it. Yeah, that hasn't been a huge difficulty. Like, you know, the guy that's, you know, the guy that's over all of our spray and then the other guy that's over all of our enhancement and landscaping, those were my first two employees. So they've been with us, been with me forever. And then, you know, our operations manager, that guy's got more knowledge and experience. I mean, it's just, unbelievable we were actually friends and ended up buying his company what a year and a half ago yeah and then he okay to work that's for awesome us. we've been blessed with that those guys are dude, they're so good yeah <laughs> and my sister is like basically our office manager she works she's essentially our csr and does all the back end stuff um and obviously that's a blessing in disguise as well because i mean you trust can't really trust anyone else more than that and she does an awesome job and now we're just finally getting to the point where Hiring, we're you know hire our first sales guy. We hire, we're about to hire another CSR, starting to build out the office. I, I think we're pretty lucky that we have a pretty good foundation to kind of build off of. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's basically been one of our priorities almost every quarter for the last year is doing something leadership related, whether it's continuing the one on ones, having better weekly meetings, better quarterly meetings, um, all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely a focus of ours, and I imagine it'll stay that way for a while, mm-hmm. forever. Are you guys using pay, P for P type uh, pay structures? I imagine. Yeah. Yep, we switched to that this year. How's that working? Oh, it's you realize you, you create a new problem, but you have to sell more work because they get so much done <laughs> so quick. Like you realize, like, oh wow, we may run out of work. <laughs> Where before that was never even like a thought no issue. <laughs> what did you? What was it before? How? Were, what was your compensation structure like before? Hourly. Yeah. Just hourly. Yeah. yeah. And the spray techs would get like a, a certain percentage bonus if they hit their goal. When I started originally, I did start with a P4P model, but then when we kind of, it kind of went away a little bit. And then, you know, with the merger and trying to figure out how to do that with landscaping and mowing and having everything in place, um, it was a little difficult, but we figured it out. And I think guys love it. The managers, it puts a little stress on them to schedule work better and route more efficiently. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that's a know, good thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. But it's it's been great. I would definitely would recommend it and wouldn't go back to it the other way. Yeah, we're experimenting. We've had versions of P4P uh, at Chorby for years. In fact, our FERC department, uh, it's still very heavily hourly, but there's a lot of performance base. There's uh, revenue per hour bonuses. There's equipment base, you know, taking care of your equipment, weekly bonuses, um, I'm really out of practice on exactly what, but, but there's a lot of performance-based bonuses. There's a quarterly bonus that they get that, um, is, is based on if they hit the, 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 the quarterly amount. So that, that helps with pe- people have taken time off and with season, uh, rain and, and the weather and that sort of thing. So that's, it's based on a 12 week revenue, but it's, it's still heavily based on hourly. Like I'm still constantly wanting to kind of tweak that. But then we also experiment with all sorts of others over at Scoop Soldiers. Scoop Soldiers has been slow. We've got a lot of hourly still. And we, our franchisees have started doing uh, performance base and or pay per yard. 
and they're all seeing huge results with it. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's night and day. So, it goes uh, back to being able to pay your people like a livable wage. Right. Yeah, yeah you mentioned to pay guys more money and mm-hmm. yeah, you're giving them that ownership. One of our one of our key principles. We've just rolled this out um, and updated. One of our core our core values is ownership mentality, and being future minded is the second uh, is the second. And 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 that's exactly that's what it does. That's what performance based pay does is it gives them an ownership mindset. And then, and that's the foundation to being able to teach and train your future leadership. Yeah, the hardest so, part was just the transparency of it, trying to get it to where everyone understands, especially with yeah. multiple divisions. Yeah. Um, that was a little bit of challenges there. I think we've worked most of them out, but I think the biggest issue most people have is just the transparency of it and how the guys know exactly what they're making. Mm-hmm. So um, what would you say is Fine Turf's biggest challenge ahead of you in 2024? Probably my my would be building out the office because we just basically hired a first salesperson hiring hopefully another CSR here in a few <laughs> months. It's getting every all the, and the flow of communication between departments, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so we're trying to we have essentially segregated departments out now. How does one tar- department talk to another? All the processes in place for dealing with that. Um, it's going to take a lot of time, but hopefully it saves the time on the back end. And you know, leadership and management does get very uneasy if there's not, if that's not in place because they don't know who to go to they don't know where this phone call should go or the, who should deal with this email between the office and operations and building out that office staff is my guess our biggest challenge this year our csr we've got a one coming in for an interview on tuesday and uh brandon's trying to poach her from the local dmv office i mean <laughs> this girl though like she is on it I mean, like she's she's got to be the best CSR in America. Like, she runs the whole DMV office. She like she'll help so, you tell everyone else down the line what's going on. She, I mean, she's got this place running like a machine. And Brandon was there getting a bunch of you know like year or whatever, and he keeps going to her and keeps saying, "Hey, will you come work for us? Hey, come that's on, awesome. Come that's on. awesome. That's awesome. So that's a, yeah. So you are actually act. You don't actually know her through an outside network. You're actually oh, no, actively no, no, no. Uh, uh, recruiting. I got her email a couple of weeks ago, and I emailed her and said, "Hey, if there's any chance of continuing this conversation, like." Please give me a call directly. And so now she's coming in for an interview. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. That's the, that's the way to do it. Yeah. I, I think our our uh, customer service and sales team at, at Chorby and Scoop Soldiers, I think we saw a huge improvement when we stopped. We started poaching. We started looking for who is really great at what they do mm-hmm. and inviting them and selling them in on the organization, the vision that we have, and getting them trained up and rock and roll and now they're, they're crushing it. I think it's a a really good approach of people. So we hired a sales guy, just, you know, sent out a message or text to a bunch of people I know and respect and said, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. If you have anybody in mind, just send them to me. I mean, he's doing phenomenal. He's doing awesome. And that, that was from a net, your personal network. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I think with some of the stuff we've been learning from the mastermind group, you know, some of it too, a lot of the hiring is like, you know, personality based and it's not so much can this person necessarily do the job, but like, you know, if you like for this example, this like CS potential CSR, you know, seeing her handle multiple situations at once, how does she deal with customers? You, like the personality, you can kind of see like she's still enjoying it while she's doing this and all the other little like X factors, I guess, we're realizing that's way more important in any position than just like, does this person know how to mow or does this person know how to spray? It's like, they do, they seem happy all the time. Are they you're greeting people? Like just the little things that we're picking up on is how we're trying to start hiring, you know, better and continue that in the process uh, going forward. It's culture. Mm-hmm. Or that culture fit, right? Because, you know, we're talking about what's hard is like, you know, we're not, you know, as prevalent and ingrained and in contact and around, you know, the new hires and, you know, guys out, you know, doing production, making production happen as much as we were a year and a half ago. So all these people that are getting hired, like, you know, are they a culture fit? Do they align with our core values? Like, are they going to make someone, you know, feel welcome when the next person comes in the door? Yep. There's an exponentiality to it. 
you've got to grow and keep up with and grow faster than the pace of your business. There. Well, I want to um, circle back around to the leadership aspect and the culture aspect, because I do think that is an incredibly important um, thing to focus on, regardless of how small or how large your organization is, your leadership is going to be determining the success um, and the, um, the, the feel and the experience of every team member um, that's there is also part of building your reputation, uh, which I know is a huge focus for you guys into this year and, and beyond that. Um, so you mentioned that there were like some monthly, weekly, quarterly meetings. What, what else are you guys doing to build a foundation um, to build up your leadership? I mean, I think that's a lot of it is probably those um, having structured meetings, trying to focus on more as best we can, higher level stuff, not like necessarily department stuff or about a particular customer. Um, so we do every week, we do a meeting, um, we do a quarterly meetings, we do a two day annual meeting um, at the end of the year. Um, and just, I guess, creating, you know, annual, annual priorities, quarterly priorities, mm-hmm. um, redoing our scorecard a few times to try to get ways to hold people accountable um, for what their job entails. And a lot of that also is about making sure someone's job role is their job role. It's not, hey, you're supposed to do this, but then we're going to ask you to do 20 other things that impacts what you're supposed to be doing. Um, so I think a lot of it comes from us of being more disciplined and not making everyone get sidetracked all the time because we do have a lot of ideas mm-hmm. and we do want to do a bunch of stuff. And so how do we manage that? You know, how do we manage? Is it, It's probably a lot better to have 10 ideas. They might, who who knows? They could all be great, but it's probably better to focus on one or two and let's get those implemented first rather than throwing the whole Throwing everything into the mix and everyone's it's chaos. Hey, Brandon, also think can I come personal, work for you? Also, think sure. like that was personal a joke, growth Adrian. goals. Like we've started doing that. We're like, you know, we have our personal growth goals, mm-hmm. and we focus on that. And then, you know, we meet with certain people within our company, you know, on a rhythm of going over their personal goals and personal growth and trying to push on that stuff outside of the business. And you know, I think for for me and Brandon, like our ability to grow personally is just as important to the business as, you know, any, any metric we would do inside of the business. Yeah. Something that like Dan Ralph said has always stuck with me about how like your business will never outgrow you. Yep. So essentially, you know, your business is going to grow to what you you're personally have grown at. So yeah, we focus a lot on personal growth um, with us and our leadership team. Like Lindsay was saying, you know, some guy, some guy wants to buy a house. It's not just, Hey, I want to sell for houses. Okay. How much you need for a down payment? What does that mean per month, per week? You know, do you have a separate bank account? Do you want to auto draft that into there? Like just going down to the details of like trying to get um, people to think about more things outside of, out of outside of work and talk about you know personal stuff. And as an owner, like man, like if you want to grow your company, like good lord, have guys come in here, you know, that are spray techs and say they want to buy a house in a year and a half, and you know you you're going to make that happen, like. That guy's going to have to move up. You're going to have to make sure there's a place for him to move up. And the amount of growth that like you're going to have to do like to push your company mm-hmm. to make some of these goals and dreams achievable, like that's kind of what started driving us, I think. You know, mm-hmm. like it was like yeah. we want this revenue, right? Or we want this margin or this metric or hit this. But it's like, no, no, like if this dude's going to buy a house, he's going to need to make this much money. And like I'm not just going to give it to him. So – we've got to grow this much and we've got to do it this mm. fast for like these guys dreams to come true. And like that yeah. drives you like that fires you up in the morning. One of know? the, one of the best feelings is when it's when you hear and when your team members begin buying houses and buying real estate and, and building their life. It's, it's, it's not something that 10 years ago I would have been, ex- I, I would have expected to be excited about, but it's a great feeling. I know what you mean. Yeah, that's, uh, we getting interference all of a sudden. We are not sure where that's coming from, but I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. That right there is going to be the hook to this podcast. That was that is unique to me because the perspective that you guys have with your growth and pushing yourselves is not totally dependent on you. It's about serving the people that are a part of the overall picture, the overall team. That's unique to me. Um, and having that very clear perspective and mindset as you guys are pushing into accomplishing these goals, um, that's a big deal. And that goes a long way with um, 
building up your team. I love getting to know. I love to get to know business owners all over the country. Uh, we do need to set something up where we can, yes. uh, uh, Lindsay, we can meet in person. And Brandon, we can see each other again and maybe share a meal together or do something, something. Maybe come by do a do a uh, shop tour. Uh, that's another part of the the tour that's... and tell you guys more about what we're doing with the T Pig tour. But yes, and for sure, if you haven't already. Follow and subscribe on our YouTube channel, Pet Way, the Pet Waste Millionaire. We've got we're, we're we're up and coming. That's what I'd like to say. Yeah, we're up and coming. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff. And and with this tour, we just got back from Tampa. Ben got back. Well, both of us got back yesterday from the the first leg of the tour in Tampa, and um, it, it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward. We're 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 taking a 40 43 foot R, uh, RV bus. From Dallas to Florida, up to the up the East Coast to D.C., uh, and then cutting across, and we'll end up all the way in Seattle before we circle back to Texas by the end of the year. So it's a it's an almost full year tour with oh, a big wow. tour bus with a big tour bus going sit market by market all over the, across the South and the West where our our Scoop Soldiers franchisees are, and the goal is to get awareness for the industry, but to build brand as we talked about in this, in this podcast and, um, and really to talk about the American dream and the things we talked about here today, uh, and how the American dream is so, so much so alive today. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'll definitely follow that. Please do. Yeah. I'd, I'd appreciate it. It's, uh, I, I'm at the point now where yesterday I was sitting at a restaurant and, uh, and I'm talking about what we're doing in, in the Pet Waste Minor Socials to the point where I had someone next to me that was trying to go and search for Pet Waste Millionaire on YouTube, but she was having a hard time spelling millionaire. And so I just grabbed the phone out of her hand and went to it and subscribed <laughs> to the YouTube channel. Uh, anyways, I believe strongly in our mission is in what we're doing here. So please go take a look. would love for you guys to follow along and, and engage with us. But uh, yeah, again, thank you so much for being present with us and uh, talking with us today. Um, I'll follow back up with you guys and let you know when abouts we're going to be in, in y'all's area so we can try to coordinate something for us to, to get actually get together. Um, and then we'll cool. get yeah. there. Absolutely. Look forward to it, guys. See y'all in a, maybe See a few weeks, a few months. Thank y'all. Thank you, guys. Y'all take care. Bye.